Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Uh, he won't tell you this, but he's real proud of those boots that he's wearing this morning. He, uh, he also won't tell you that Olivia got him dressed, so there you go. <laughs> Oh, I think I'm way funnier than I am sometimes. <laughs> How are you guys doing this morning? Doing good. good. It is so good to see all of you. Uh, we are in our last week of our series, Fight My Battles, and I am really excited for where God is going to take us this morning. Um, but before we go there, will you join me in prayer uh, together? God, thank you so much for who you are. God, thank you for what you're doing. God, even as we uh, talk about what's coming up in this uh, next month here, God, I just uh, I pray that for people who are uh, maybe not sure about taking a faith step like baptism, God, may you um, prompt them and, and may they be obedient to, to your voice in their lives, God. God, we uh, are just so thankful for what you're doing in people's lives in our church. God, I pray for the small groups that are launching this week and for the small groups that are continuing. Um, God, may we just grow deeper in community with each other and, and with you as a result of what you're doing. So God, we love you, and I pray that you'll speak through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So about six, six years ago, uh, we welcomed home a foster child named Shoshana. And Shoshana was an eight-year-old little girl who came to live with us. And anybody who's been a foster parent for any length of time will tell you that usually the first 30 days are some of the most challenging days of a new foster care placement because you're getting used to new rhythms and finding out new behaviors that you didn't know existed and all of these different things. And that was certainly true with Shoshana. We were getting to know her. She was getting to know us. And as we were kind of getting used to life together, we began to notice some different behaviors that began to emerge. We were not parents at the time, so remember uh, that. And so one of the behaviors was that she would often go dig through the cupboards at night for food, which if you're a parent, you know that's very normal for any kid to do. My kids still do that uh, today. But we'd walk downstairs in the morning, and we'd find like an empty carton of ice cream I'm like, geez, you ate like 21 pounds. How'd you down that whole thing of ice cream overnight? Or an empty bag of chips or an empty bag of crack. I mean, she's eating tons and tons of food overnight. We begin thinking to ourselves, how is this little girl eating so much food in the middle of the night? And more importantly, why is she eating so much food in the middle of the night? And so we, we let it go for a few days, and we kept noticing this trend, and then we also noticed like other food was like going missing from our cupboards, and we're like, man, what is going on? So finally, we go up to her bedroom and uh, pull back her covers and notice there is tons of food hiding underneath her covers. There's food underneath her bed, and not just like a little bit of food, but like you can't even see underneath the bed. There's so much food underneath there with rot, rat droppings and bugs, and it's just gross. And Sam and I were sitting there, and we were like, man, why is this girl taking so much food in the middle of the night? So we went to our social worker, and we asked her, and she said, man, that is a surefire sign of trauma that when somebody has walked through a traumatic experience or childhood, it literally rewires their brain. It impacts their ability to trust. It impacts their ability to develop emotionally and, and, and healthy ways. And, and for Shoshana, she came from a, a home that was so insecure when it came to food. She didn't always know where her next meal would come from. She didn't always know if there would be food available on the table. And so when she got to our house, strangers that she didn't trust, she wanted to take that under control as much as she possibly could. Now, it's easy for us to look at a story like that and think to ourselves, man, trauma is someone else's experience. 
However, all of us navigate unhealed wounds in one way or another. Every single one of us have some, you can call it trauma if you want to get clinical, but unhealed wounds is a part of every single one of our lives. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. You know the feeling when you're scrolling through your news feed and something pops up and you just get that like angst and anger inside of you, right? Like either you disagree with it or it's just flat out wrong and you just, something bubbles up inside of you that just wants to lash out. There's something beneath that. That's an unhealed wound. For others of us, maybe you missed a deadline at work or you get a poor performance review and you take that failure on as identity and you say, I am a failure. And, and, it, and it goes deeper than just like, I failed once, but it's my identity. Man, that is, that is unhealed trauma in your life. There's something deeper below that. Or on the flip side, you work your butt off and you get the promotion, you get the raise and you take that on as an identity, that's also unhealed the wounds in your life. When your identity is based in your performance and how well you behave. Maybe you've made a mistake in the past. Maybe you have deep shame and regret in your story. Maybe you had an abortion or a failed relationship or something in your life and you've just never dealt with it and it just remains unhealed and just kind of circulates in your life. Maybe you have a parent who overlooked you a pastor who mistreated you, a relative who hurt you. And every single one of us, I don't care if you would consider your life relatively easy or good, all of us have unhealed wounds in our lives. Every single one of us, because the reality is we live in a broken and sinful world. Every single one of us. And one thing that I've noticed over the last couple months is that in the midst of this virus, in the midst of political and racial unrest, in the midst of joblessness and economic uncertainty, those wounds are on display for the world to see. In fact, I might argue that when people look at the church today, it seems like our lives are more shaped right now by our collective wounds than our collective healing. Especially <laughs> for those of us who watched that debate on what Tuesday night, it's like woundedness all around, right? Like trauma all around. But whether, whether we like to admit it or not, unhealed trauma, unhealed wounds inform a lot of our lives. They're like a war within us that can attack at any given time and without warning. It's an enemy that can attack and, and seems to have no end. And, and the question that I want to ask today as we look at this final battle is perhaps one of the most important questions we could ask. How does God heal our deepest wounds? Does he even care about the stuff under the surface? In the midst of a, a pandemic, in the midst of uh, upheaval, maybe you lost your job, maybe you lost a relationship in this season, does God even care about the deepest wounds in your life and how does he go about healing them? Because here's what I know. A healed person can look at someone they disagree with, whether it be politically, culturally, whatever, and love them in the midst of that disagreement. A healed person can fail and not take that on as identity or succeed and not take that on as identity. A healed person doesn't perform better. They're freed from the need to perform altogether. And that's what God desires for each and every one of us. And that's what I want to talk about today. How does God heal the deepest wounds in our lives? And make no mistake, I know this is a heavier topic this morning, and I love you enough to go there this morning, if that's okay. Uh, and so as we, as we uh, dive into the word today, I can't think of a more wounded, traumatized group of people than the Israelites right after they are freed from Egypt, right? So for 400 years, they have been enslaved, they have been traumatized, they have been tortured, they have been oppressed. And this is a people that is literally within a short period of time, we don't know exactly how long, but within a very short period of time, they are wandering they are uh, still kind of reeling from the escape of leaving Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. They have no home. They have no battle skills. They haven't really fought a battle in centuries. Think about it. They've been slaves. So they have no home. They have no battle skills. And all they have is a promise from a God who seemed to have, been, have abandoned them for 400 years. 
And it's in this moment of vulnerability, of unhealed wounds, of trauma for the Israelites that they are attacked by a people called the Amalekites. And so if you have your Bible, join me in Exodus 17, 8 through 10, as we look at this extremely unhealed group of people. Verse 8 says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. By the way, Rephidim means resting place. So there's a little bit of irony there that a war happens at the resting place. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill and this, with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So this is the very first time that Israel is attacked after they leave Egypt. This is a battle with the people called the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites are a people that show up over and again throughout the Old Testament. The Amalekites are descendants of Abraham and his grandson Esau. The Amalekites are people that have one goal, and that's to obliterate the Israelites. And their method for doing it is to attack the weakest, most vulnerable, easiest targets in the whole Israelite camp. They go for the, the, the weakest targets first. In fact, scholars describe the Amorites, sorry, not Amorites, Amalekites, as a people whose hand was constantly against the throne of God. Over and over again. You see them warring against Moses when he's leading. You see them warring against Saul, David, Hezekiah. Even in the story of Esther, which is one of my favorite stories in Scripture, Haman, who desires to destroy the Israelites, is a descendant of the Amalekites. So this people over and again want to destroy God's people and they attack Israel when they are vulnerable, they attack them when they are still traumatized, when they're still unhealed, and when they are in their most disoriented place, the Amalekites attack the Israelites. Man, as I think back to my foster daughter, Shoshana, as she is in this vulnerable place, this place where everything she's known has been flipped on its head. She's been taken from her home and placed with strangers. We began to wonder, like, how do you experience some level of healing when everything you know has been flipped on its head? So we began to ask our counselors this. We began to ask our social workers this. What do we do to help address this behavior of hoarding food in the middle of the night? Of course we want her to get food if she's hungry in the middle of the night. But how do we address the underlying wound and behavior beneath that? You know what our counselors told us? They said, you need to teach her that you can be trusted. You need to teach her that in your home, food won't be insecure. And so what they told us to do is they said, get a box of food, put it on the nightstand right next to her bed, and make sure she knows that nobody, nobody can touch that box of food. That it will always be full, that it will never not have food in it, and when you eat from it, we'll refill it again and again for you. And what this did for Shoshana is this box of food, she didn't even need to eat from it all that often, but it became a box of security in the middle of the night and during her days that food was not going to be an issue in her home. It was a symbol. It was a signal and it was a, a conduit for Shoshana for some level of healing in her life as this box of food never left the side of her bed. What I love about Israel's story as they are attacked by the Amalekites, as they are a people that is vulnerable and unhealed, is that God does the exact same thing with Israel. See, God gives Israel a symbol through Moses' staff. Believe it or not, this is not the actual staff of Moses. I had to find another one because Elevation Church needed it this week, but I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, this is actually my staff. This says Brad on it. Somebody from church gave it to me. But this staff for the Israelite people becomes like this box of food in the middle of the night, this symbol that God is with you, that he has not abandoned you, that he has not left you. And if you think about the story of the Exodus over and over and over again, God uses Moses' staff as the symbol for the Israelites. He does it with Moses at the burning bush where he says, Moses, cast your staff on the ground and watch it turn into a snake. He does it when Moses goes to Egypt and shows signs and wonders to the Egyptian people by turning the Nile into blood, by striking it with a staff and calling down all these different plagues from heaven. He uses his staff. 
When the Israelites arrived at the Red Sea and they begin complaining and saying, it would be better to be back in Egypt, what does God have Moses do? Part the Red Sea with his staff. When they find themselves in Exodus 17, just a few verses before this, at a rock where they are thirsty and they are grumbling and they are saying, it was better in Egypt, at least we had water back there. What does God have Moses do? He has Moses strike the rock with his staff. By the way, for those of you who are familiar with kind of the general story, it was pointed out to me after first service that um, somebody thought that there was only one time where Moses got water out of a staff or out of a rock. Um, There's actually two. The first one is in Exodus 17 when God told him to to hit it with his staff. The second one is in Numbers 20 when God said, speak to the rock, and Moses struck it because he was was mad at his people. The point is, (laughs) it's like spanking, I don't know, whatever. Uh, The point is, is that this staff, almost for the Israelite people, it became this symbol of healing, of security, of like, God is with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He's right here. Your whole world has been flipped on its head, but God is still right here with you. Man, when I read Israel's story, I see unhealed wounds all over the place. One of the things they tell you when you become a foster parent is that no matter how bad the situation is that a kid came from, they will often want to go right back to that abusive, neglectful situation. It's exactly what the Israelites say and do. Take us back to Egypt. Take us back to slavery. Take us back to the land of the oppression. They couldn't see the signal in the middle of the night. They could not see the symbol that God had provided them, that he was with them, because their 400 years of collective trauma informed their lives way more than the healing that God wanted for them after they left Egypt. Israel had a vision for the future that was rooted in a distorted view of the past. Say that again. Israel had a vision for the future, and it was rooted in a distorted view of the past. They could not see the symbol. And you know what? You and I, we give our our past a lot of power, don't we? Way more than we realize sometimes. We give our past power when there are parts of our past that are just left undealt with, unhealed, untalked about, and we just perpetuate that hurt. Pain that is not transformed is transmitted. Some of us have navigated serious Egypt periods in our lives, and I'm not discounting that. Some of us have navigated Egypt periods just this year. We've navigated tremendous pain, tremendous difficulty, whether it be in seasons of suffering at the hand of a parent or a spouse, a job loss where we feel the the fear of financial insecurity, addiction, and we're grasping for a symbol of security as much as we possibly can, whether it be a child or a spouse, and putting unrealistic expectations on them, whether it be a political candidate or a job or whatever it might be, money. See, we're grasping. We're grasping for security for so many of us, and we're looking at the wrong places. Another way we have a distorted view of our past is by believing that the past is way better than it is right now. That we just need to get back to the glory days. And we miss the new thing that God wants to do in a new season, in a new way. This is exactly why Israel, the Jewish people, missed Jesus as the Messiah. They had a vision for the past. They wanted the Messiah to return Israel to her past glory. Instead, Jesus came as a different kind of Messiah from what they were expecting, and they missed it. We find ourselves in the same place as Israel, in Rephidim, asking the same thing that the Israelites are asking as we're grasping for security, as we're grasping for some source of hope and our wounds are left unhealed. We ask the same thing they do in Exodus 17, 7 here in this story. Is the Lord among us or not? They couldn't see the symbol of healing that God was providing for them. And as a result, when we do this, when we grasp for the wrong places for hope and for healing, we rage the wrong wars. We rage the wrong political wars. We rage the wrong cultural wars. We rage the wrong relation wars, the wrong spiritual wars. And it comes out in all kinds of different ways. Passive aggressiveness, lashing out towards others, that's unhealed trauma in your life. Jealousy, 
comparison, self-loathing, all of that's unhealed trauma in your life. Complaining, cynicism, doubting God, all of that is unhealed trauma. And I want to remind you that Israel had already been liberated from Egypt at this point. They had already been freed from slavery, and yet they were still dealing with so much junk in their lives that were left unhealed. And here's what I absolutely believe, that God did not just want to get Israel out of Egypt. He wanted to get Egypt out of Israel. See, God wasn't just leading Israel to a, a land of milk and honey and, and you know, abundance and prosperity. He was leading Israel to a land of true, full, complete healing. Some of us have been saved for as long as we can remember. We've been freed from the grasp of sin and from death, but we still remain unhealed of the wounds of our past. There's still areas of our life that the cross of Jesus Christ has not yet touched, has not yet healed, has not yet spoken into. And as a result, we remain stuck grasping for the wrong things. This is exactly what happens to Israel. And the Amalekites become this symbol, this metaphor throughout the Old Testament of every force of evil that wants to destroy God's promise, God's people, and God's redemption in the world. I love what happens in verse 11 here as the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites. Whenever Moses held up his hand with a staff, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. It's a single signal. It's a symbol. Whenever Moses raised his hands in intercession, in prayer, lifting up the name of God, lifting up this symbol, the staff, for Israel to see and for Israel to fight around, the Israelites prevailed. But when they lost sight of it, the Amalekites prevailed. Friends, the spirit of Amalek is alive and well today. It's not gone. Satan continues to roam and seek vulnerable people to devour. The forces at work to stop the redeeming work of God in the world are strong, and some of them exist within the church. Paul writes in Ephesians that our enemy is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the evil spiritual forces in the world. And I want to ask you the question, where are you living unhealed right now? Where are you living out of the spirit of Amalek? Are you living out of fear of a, a virus? I mean, it's okay to be cautious, but is that dominating your every thought, your every move, and you're missing the signal of what God wants to do in this next season? Are you living out of fear of a crashing economy? It's okay to have concerns about an economy. It is not okay to have that consume your every thought and identity and miss the signal of what God wants to do in this season. Amen. Are you living out of a sin issue, anger, indifference, generational addictions, God wants to get your attention through a symbol of healing and security. You living unhealed in a broken relationship, past or current abuse, God wants your attention and to give you a symbol and sign of healing. Watch what God does for this unhealed people in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, don't miss this, the Lord is my banner. Saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. What is Moses doing here with this altar? What he's saying here is the Lord, he is my symbol, he is my signal, he is my banner. It's the Hebrew word Jehovah Nisi. He is the banner under which I stand. That as Israel, as Moses lifted his hands in prayer with the staff in his hands, and Israel prevailed when the staff was lifted up, he is setting this battle as a reminder for the people of Israel that no matter what trauma or trial they walk through in the future, no matter what they've been through in the past, the Lord is a constant, the Lord is a banner, a standard under which you can stand. Amen. And that's the point of the story. It's Jehovah Nisi. It's can you see God fighting your battles on your behalf? 
Can you see the way that he was at work, even in the midst of a global pandemic, even in the midst of a chaotic election, even in the midst of uncertain and unchanged plans? Can you see the God who is fighting battles on your behalf? Are you looking for him? Are you looking for the standard, the symbol in the middle of the night, whether it's a box of food or a staff? Are you looking for the thing that God is providing to remind you you are not alone? He has not abandoned you. He is your standard, your banner of healing and wholeness. Amen. The question remains, what is our Jehovah Nisi? In the midst of unhealed pain, unhealed trauma, unhealed wounds, does God provide us with a signal of healing? Does he provide us with a banner under which we can stand for healing, to remind ourselves, just like the Israelite people, that we are not alone and that he is fighting battles on our behalf? The answer is yes, he does. And it talks about it here in Isaiah 11. It's a prophetic word. It says, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. Isaiah is talking about the glorified Christ here. The root of Jesse is Jesus. Jesus is a Jehovah Nisi for a new generation of people. Jesus is a banner of healing, a banner of wholeness, a banner of transformation for all people, for all time. He is our Jehovah Nisi. Amen. So the question I want to ask you today is what banner are you standing under? What is your box of food that you're clinging to in the middle of the night? Is it the banner of your own trauma? Is it the banner of fear and scarcity? It is, is it the banner of misplaced hope or the banner of a political candidate or the banner of temporary security? Guys, I'm not interested in being a church that looks just as wounded as the rest of the world and is barely recognizable from the Amalekites. I'm not interested in being a church where we just bicker and hate and picket and post and scream like the rest of the world. Goodness, the people of God are barely recognizable from the world in the way that we are engaging the world right now. The banner under which we stand, the, the thing that we cling to, no other. I'm sorry, but it's not Trump and it's not Biden. It is Jesus. And it is time the church acted like it. Sorry, I'm a little, I was on Facebook a little too much this morning. (laughs) The point is I'm not interested in being a church that's just glories in our own shame. Paul talks about this in Philippians 3. I want people to see New Life Church and see a people that has experienced healing. I'm not interested in being a church that is discipled by the flavor of the day that Fox News or CNN or whoever it is tells us we should give our attention to. I'm interested in being a church that is focused on Jehovah Nisi, that banner on a hill that takes God at his word, that moves in signs and wonders and sees healing because of what God is doing because we are lifting him up as our standard, as our banner of miracles and healing. I'm interested in seeing a church that is equipped to hold her peace in the midst of the chaos and the trauma of this world. We all have unhealed wounds. Every single one of us. And we all have opportunity for healing through the person of Jesus. Let me tell you about my story. I, uh, I grew up in a very conservative Christian home. And uh, I never, uh, never really fit in very well, if that's, if that's okay to say. I was never, um, never super good at like sports, very, very like sports obsessed family. And uh, didn't really know how to throw or catch a football. Was never good at it. Um, I was not good at being handy or the things that normal boys were supposed to do. Anybody see the movie like Sandlot before? Scotty Smalls, one of the best movies ever. That, that was me. That is me. Let's, let's be honest. That is me. I still can't throw or catch a baseball. Um, but like walking around with his friends, like, don't be a goofus. Don't be a goof. Like that's, that was me as a kid all the time. Like, I never fit in. I never seemed to measure up to that. I was uh, far more interested in being creative, which I was told was a deficit. Um, I always felt like I was 
letting my parents down or I didn't measure up because I wasn't a normal boy. And it got worse and worse as things went. Um, during middle and high school, I got bullied horribly. Um, got called gay, got called faggot, got called any name under the sun that you can imagine. And uh, it, it happened a lot at um, my school, my, my Christian school, <laughs> my church, um, my neighborhood. There was a time where I was at a retreat uh, in middle school, and uh, the guys in my group were kind of, in my cabin were kind of making fun of me for uh, not being as good at the like game or whatever we had just done, right? For not being coordinated. And uh, so they started calling me gay, they started calling me faggot, not anything I hadn't heard before. Uh, but then the leader of the group of us, well-intentioned as he was, was like, guys, guys, don't make fun of him because one in seven kids struggle with their sexuality, struggle with you know, this type of stuff. And you know what the kids did? They counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It was fuel for their fire. Happened at home happened at school, it happened all over the place. The message I began to believe about myself, the unhealed wound that began to take root in my life is you're not normal. You're different. You're not loved. You're alone. I mean, even to this day, I have to like research lion's jokes so I can learn names when I tell them on stage here. <laughs> like, and I, I would cry myself to sleep a lot. I mean, it was bad. But I couldn't tell anybody I was crying myself to sleep because real men don't cry, right? Wrong. I cry. So I compensated. If I couldn't be manly enough in the area of sports or being handy, I would just get myself a temper. And I would be manly enough in the area of anger. And I would control and I would dominate and I would yell. And that's where I could be man enough. If I couldn't be man enough anywhere else. And uh, man, the unhealed wound festered for a long, long time. Even after Sam like, found out she was pregnant with our first child, I was obsessed with having a boy. Because in my mind, having a girl meant I wasn't as masculine. That's messed up. And uh, it led to a lot of like, depression, a lot of anxiety, just feeling like I never measured up. I never was worthy of love because I wasn't a normal boy. And I'll never forget sitting in a counselor's office kind of in the, the heap of this anger and this depression and just saying, what do I do? If I can't change the things that are not changeable about myself, what do I do? He said, where have you gotten your definition of what it means to be a man? Where's your standard? What are you looking to for that? I said, well, the church, <laughs> God. I said, no, no, you're not. I said, you're looking to the world to tell you that. Sometimes it's mixed in with the church and you can't really tell them apart, but you're looking to the world to tell you what it means to be a man. You want to know what it means to be a man? Go read the Gospels. Look at the life of Jesus. And I'll never forget what he encouraged me to do. He said, just start reading through the Gospels. Read through the Gospels through the lens of your own wounds and start making notes in the margins of what Jesus did that was actually masculine. That Jesus is your perfect picture of what it means to be a real man. And so you can literally, you can look in my Bible, there are hundreds and hundreds of notes in the margins where I just wrote and I just like, there's tear stains on, this, on these pages because I write here and it's like, Real men are spirit-led. Real men withstand temptation to be powerful and prideful. Real men are righteous. They love God and they love other people. Real men get angry about the right things. They elevate women. They run towards the vulnerable. They have faith. They participate in the coming kingdom of God. Amen. And as I begin to slowly read through the Gospels. You know what God did for me? He began to intersect those places of deepest wounds, those places of most unhealing. 
and I got a new standard of what it means to be healed. And it doesn't come from anything other than the person of Jesus made known in your life. Amen. Not knowing about him, not just reading about him, but actually internalizing who he is and what he did. Chances are your wound is not the same as mine, but you know what your wound is. And no matter what your wound is, you can do this exact same thing in the Gospels. If your wound is putting too much identity and performance, take that to the Gospels here. Read about how Jesus navigated life with people who failed and succeeded miserably. Start in John 21, where he reinstates Peter. Your wound past abuse... Read story after story in the gospel of Jesus disrupting abuse and elevating the abused and them finding their healing in him. Amen. Is your wound anger? Anger is not a sin by itself. But you better believe that Jesus got angry about the right things. And that for many people that struggle with anger, they're looking for a fight because they're not in the right one. Read about how Jesus got angry. Channel your anger into things that Jesus got angry about. And I promise you, you will begin to experience healing when Jesus is your Jehovah Nisi, your standard of healing and wholeness and redemption in the world. He's done it for me. It's taken a few years and he can do it for you. Will you pray with me as, as we worship? Jesus, Jesus, you are so good. I'm overwhelmed with your goodness. God, I want to pray for people in this room right now who are maybe just stuck in their own wounds, whether it's messages they were told as a kid, whether it's a, a spouse that has let them down or a, a job that they seem to constantly fail at, God. God, you are fighting battles on their behalf. And I pray that every single person in this room will experience healing and wholeness because you are their Jehovah Nisi. You are their banner. You are the signal, the standard that they look to under which they stand. And so, God, we know that you are in the business of healing, that you are in the business of transforming God, for people that are signed up for small groups, may that be a catalyst for healing in people's lives. God, for people that make the step to get baptized over the next three weeks, may that be a catalyst in people's lives to say, you know what, I'm no longer going to let my wounds define me. I want my church to know it is Jesus who defines me. And God... In the midst of a chaotic and tumultuous season, may you speak a different story of healing and redemption and wholeness over our lives and over our church. Jesus, we love you. We cling to you. It's in your name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Go ahead and stand and join us as we worship and sing together.